The moment is here, you can stop your search. It's Comics by Perch. Hey everybody, this is Perch. Uh, a couple of you sent me this. I actually retweeted it to myself, or re-X'd it. I re-X'd it. Put the X all up. Yeah, anyway. Um, it's a quote from um, uh, Michael uh, Gombos in the uh, Found and Translation panel, San Diego Comic-Con. And he said um, this, this statement, which taken you know, by itself is, uh, is it's, uh, pretty powerful, uh, but there's a lot of nuance and details to it, which strangely may make it more powerful. But let's, let's explain. Um, and a number of you sent me this, so thank you uh, very much. Uh, it says, it's important to remember that manga was made for Japanese readers. At Dark Horse Comics, manga is 1% of our output, but represents 66% of our sales. So, let me read that to you again, because if you didn't see this quote, you may be going, wait, wait what? It's important to remember, because there's a bunch of statements buried in here. Let me get rid of the first one, because it's, uh, that's, that's a whole other thing to talk about. It says, at Dark Horse Comics, manga is 1% of our output, but represents 66% of our sales. So first off, is that true? You know, being said, um, you know, in a panel by someone at Dark Horse. So, I mean, you know, a guy can't be lying about his own company. So is it true? The answer is pretty much yes. Why the pretty much? Well, it, because there's some nuance there around the time period we're talking about what was produced. Sometimes manga represents more in the library, sometimes less. Uh, but more importantly, it's, uh, you know, manga for them and this is comics in general, it's a cumulative effect, meaning what happens one month is important, but if you're, you know, if your company is producing comics every single month, then, you know, success builds on success. If you have a hit comic, and you see this with Marvel right now, it's really important you understand this point. If you have something like Spider-Man, and it's a big hit, lots of people buy it, you know, 10 years down the road, you could have a bad run of a year and a half, two years, and the comic sales will still largely stay up because the momentum of that title carries it forward. And so it's important to bring that into account with Dark Horse because you know they you know they, they've had ups and downs. They've had times when they published more manga. They've had times when they've been very successful with manga way 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 back in the day. They made a lot of money off Dirty Pair, if you remember that that book. Um, but anyway, they they've made a lot of money off manga mainly due to that cumulative effect. Now, you may be saying, oh, well, this is per try to diminish what that means. It's actually kind of the opposite. The staying power of titles is critical to your success. If you don't have it, I mean, it's, it's why they keep, you know, cranking out Batman and Spider-Man. It's why they keep doing this. Dark Horse has not had a, a massive uh, manga hit. Uh, they've had some, I think Berserk was published. They've had some things that are definitely big hits. But they're not dealing with like the My Hero Academia, One Piece, uh, Demon Slayer, Chainsaw Man type books. Uh, the ones that are, you know, considered today mega hits. Yet despite that, not only has the title sold powerfully for the company, it's carried it through where even when their publishing output drops to say 1%, the cumulative effect on their line is high and it keeps selling books. Once they've established, hey, this is something we're playing in and we can make money there, they can keep making money there and, and frankly, make money easier. I mean, the other part to all this is, you know, you, you could make the, uh, the easy argument that if it's 1% of their publishing output, it means they're putting very little marketing, very little attention toward the manga that they're producing. Yet, it is the majority of their sales, two thirds of their sales. So a bunch of things to take away from this. First of all, it's not a big uh, endorsement of manga, although manga certainly is, is the beneficiary here. But it shows you what happens if you commit to a book, commit to a genre, if you put material out, it's a decent quality, and more importantly, it's in tune with what the mass market is looking for in a comic. 
if you if you do those things, you you are rewarded with sales. Uh, when Dark Horse did manga, I mean, again, you could you can make an argument that when they first started into it, there was limited interest in manga in the U.S. Back in the eighties, uh, it was you know there 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 was interest, but it was it was more of a niche product. And Dark Horse curated it, stuck with it, built it up over time as, you know, a very small part of their line, admittedly. But they did that. They, you know, that that argument that people say, like, we need to find that new audience. Dark Horse found it. They found an audience for manga and they they stuck with it and they built. Now you might say, well, doesn't this uh, isn't this a good endorsement for Marvel and DC trying things for new audiences? I, I, I mean, the premise is OK. But the tactics are wrong. You know, one thing that Dark Horse did is they they largely did they did not take kind of existing property. They didn't take Hellboy and said, okay, we're gonna go a bold new direction that is against what the fans of Hellboy enjoy, and we're going to go full manga storytelling style. They were smart about the licenses they had. They had Star Wars and they produced Star Wars content. They also produced a Star Wars manga series. That went out in a Tonkaban format that that sold quite well. I was one of their strong sellers back, uh, this would be like 20, more than 20 years ago. Um, you know, that's a smart publishing strategy. Now, the question mark is if you're a dark horse, why did you leave it at 1%? Uh, that, that's an interesting question. If, if they saw this momentum, if they saw these sales, you would think the Dark Horse for their buying power and everything else that they, they had for a while would have, you know, quickly tried to snatch up, you know, a Viz or a Tokyo Pop before, you know, it got some strength under it. You would think the Dark Horse would have acquired their way to grow that market. Uh, that's a that's a question I don't have an answer to. But it's uh it it, it there's a lot of parts about the strategy that make this not terribly surprising. Um, and yes, manga is strong for sure. Manga is strong in the U.S. It's something that that has a you know the the crossover new audience publishers want, and you know that Dark Horse benefited from it. So big credit to manga certainly, but there's equal amounts of credit to you found a strategy, you built it up over time. This is the result. That that's you know again the the puzzling part for Dark Horse or the the misstep here is. When this was succeeding, they they really should have kept pushing it to go from one percent of their output to maybe five percent, ten percent. I mean, if you're bringing in those numbers, you can make the argument that, hey, you know, don't grow it too much. Just you know, get the per, you know, really be really high level of quality control. So you're you're going to bust the best stuff. Your your revenue dollars are you know you're not publishing any duds. The Dark Horse has not every manga book that Dark Horse has put out has sold amazingly. Plenty of it stunk. But it's, it's, it's a striking quote. The other part, um, going back to the very beginning, uh, it's important to remember that manga was made for Japanese readers. This is a bit of a misstatement, in my view. Uh, it's, it's kind of factually true in that a lot of this content, uh, a lot of manga content, was made in Japan for Japan. That was they, there was never really kind of an imagination of going beyond Japan. That's where it was set. Now it, it you know there's if I'm being picky about it, Dark Horse produced uh, quite a bit of manga, you know, for the U.S. market in mind. So they did not just produce you know manga, or they didn't just reprint basically manga in Japan. They did a lot, you know, they did a lot you know, deliberately for the U.S. with mixed results. So, you know, they're, they're kind of, that, that's kind of a dodgy statement there. But where I disagree is, it, while it's factually true that manga is, you know, when originally created, its destination point is Japan, I think the elephant in the room is that manga storytelling and the content and the, the, the book itself uh, appeals to audiences outside of Japan in a, in a fairly big way. And, you know, we, there's plenty I've done videos and others have too debating why that is. Uh, I think the kind of ease of getting into the storytelling is one of them, but there's a lot of reasons. But it, it's, it's one of those um, parts that I think for U.S. publishers and creators, 
they really need to to contemplate um, what this is saying. And what it's saying is, hey, uh, you know, here's something that was made for a region outside the U.S. that has massive popularity in the U.S. And so it's worth <laughs> it's worth kind of really understanding um, what makes for crossover appeal, because as you've all heard over and over and over, the publishers are highly interested, desperate to get that new audience to get more people in. They that that is you you cannot go a month without hearing it. And you can't go a month without hearing some of the shills in the news talking about uh, the importance of an audience that isn't you, and which is why, which is quite frankly, the basis behind why a lot of people say it. They don't believe they have a very limited interest in actually getting that new audience, that mythical new audience. I believe they have a high interest in basically poking you and saying. Yeah, you're not important anymore. We want someone else. Who is that someone else? Ah, nobody really knows. Or has a real plan of how to get there. But screw you. We don't want you. And that's, you know, when, when Heidi McDonald talks about the importance of a new audience, I, it, I don't think she cares at all about the new audience, particularly. I think she cares about saying you're not welcome, quite frankly. But this is a case where um, in Japan, they're saying here's content culturally opposite in many ways, the United States, the Western world, other regions around the world, and yet it has a uh, it has a crossover appeal that publishers here in the U.S. and other places in the world would die for. There's a lesson to be learned there too. Anyway, pretty striking quote. Um, it's uh, it's kind of getting brushed under the rug. San Diego Comic Con. As I'm looking at the news. Um, it's it's pretty bizarre. The biggest bit of news coming out of San Diego Comic Con is a lot of people clouding on the fact that Barbie made a lot of money, and therefore uh, LGBTQIA themes are super popular and will make you tons of cash. And that's uh, that that is the the most repeated headline from San Diego Comic Con, which is bizarre. But but anyway, kind of a weird. I caught up with a lot of people uh, from the convention, and there was a real mixed bag. There were some people who had a, a good time and good experiences. Sounds like Sean Gordon Murphy had an amazing time at the massive booth, Blake Norcott over there. Uh, it, it just just doing really, really well with Massive, um, big lines and everything else. And then, um, you know, I, I've, I've heard from some other people who had a pretty rough time. Thankfully, no big accidents, so glad to be wrong on that one. Uh, but did hear of uh, some some rough nights and uh, you know some some bar con shenanigans that I'm sure will be covered someday if the people involved ever fall out of favor. But ah, we'll see. Anyway, I, crazy fun with numbers. Thanks for listening. Or so the Germans would have us believe. <laughs>